Judge Andra Ackerman is currently a city court judge handling the criminal cases for the city of Cohoes. She holds over a decade of experience as a special victims prosecutor. The majority of those years, she has supervised over 20 attorneys while handling her own caseload that included child homicide and serial rape trials. Over her career as a prosecutor, she has handled numerous child exploitation cases, including child sex trafficking. She is the former director of the Office of Human Tracking Prevention and Policy for the State of New York, a former member of the New York State Children's Justice Task Force and consultant to the New York State Child Advocacy Resource and Consultation Center. She earned her judicial degree from the University of Buffalo School of Law in Buffalo, New York. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the Honorable Judge Andra Ackerman. Good morning. I have to tell you, when Brett asked me to come out here, I thought what could be better than standing in front of so many professionals who dedicate their lives to helping our children succeed in this world. So I want to start by thanking you all for the work that you do every day. In a minute, it may be a challenge, this will be the first for me telling my story, but you're going to hear some very personal things about my past and my life. And I do that for two reasons. The first is it helps you understand the program that I created. It's called You Can. We'll get into that in more detail. But knowing my backstory, you'll understand why I immediately recognized the need and knew that we had to do this and we had to do it fast. But more importantly, my hope is that my story will help inspire each and every one of you make you see the amazing power that you have to help our struggling youth. And when I say amazing power to help, I don't just mean math and history and teaching them in that way. I mean helping them to see, helping them to believe in themselves. Because if you can help them believe in themselves, man, the math and the history, that comes easy. And I'm hoping that by sharing my story, you'll understand that each and every child that's up there and you'll start with a picture of me here. All of the kids out there, we all have our story, and every kid before you has theirs. And a lot of their past they can't control. But we have the power to help them, help them believe in themselves, and help them get on the right path. So that being said, this is me. Um, I was three, and the reason why I start with this picture is because when you meet these kids, when they start school, Man, they come to you with a past that they have no control over, right? My life started, the trauma and the poverty started with me when I was born. I'm going to start with my mother. And I want to remind you as I tell you the story that this little girl knew this, but you wouldn't know unless you took the time to see beneath the surface of the poverty and of the lice, which we'll talk about later, because I had it a lot. My mother never wanted to be a mother. She had my brother Tommy when she was 26. By the time she was 24, she was a huge alcoholic, drunk one day, um, sick the next. She was an every other day drunk. After having my brother for two years, she realized that uh, she didn't want him anymore, and she left him um, with his father. She went on to be with many men. Um, she used abortion as her form of birth control and had five of them before my sister was born. She went to abort my sister, and a doctor told her about this amazing thing in 1967 called welfare. And my mom was homeless at the time and a drunk with no job. So when she learned that she could get an apartment and she could get money to live on, she listened to the doctor and she had my sister. That's my sister at a place called St. Catherine's Orphanage, because my mother was very smart at the same time and loved to scam the system. So when she was pregnant, she got in line, got the apartment, and she got the check um, in the mail. And when my sister was born, she promptly gave her up to St. Catherine's, calling, saying she was destitute. She took the money and the place to live, and she did that for about two years. My sister was raised by nuns at St. Catherine's, 
And oddly enough, by the way, I'm going to tell you right now, my sister's amazing and doing great. My sister didn't speak for the first two years she was raised at St. Catherine's. They thought she was, their words were deaf and dumb. We know this because our mother told us and thought it was funny. It took two years back then for welfare to catch up that they were giving my mother money, but, they, but she didn't, wasn't taking care of my sister. So they told her, you either take her back or you lose the money. So she went and got my sister. But for over two years, that's her at a birthday party at St. Catherine's, um, being raised um, in an orphanage. So that's my sister and I. When my mom was pregnant with me, we all have different fathers. Um, she realized that she could get additional money um, if she had me, so she chose to have me. We know this because our mother told us this growing up. We knew we were a check is the reason why we were born. My mother met many men. There was one that moved us into this place here. Um, we went on to live with him from, by the time I was six months old, we were living with him up until just um, shortly after this picture was taken. When we left that home, she brought us to a place called St. Coleman's, which was another orphanage. While she was away, she met a man named Don, who was also an alcoholic. Thank God he was not an abuser, just a regular drunk, who also could not hold a job. When she picked us up, we moved in with him, and he stayed with us for four years. The children, the teachers in our lives had no idea what this was going on. All they saw were the two girls here. We didn't hold our eyes up very often. We kept ourselves very quiet, and we were told not to tell. So this was me by nine, and bear with me, I, I, I'm usually used to walking around, so being, being here is a, a challenge for me. Um, but if you saw this picture of this girl, you'd have no idea that she was getting high regularly. We called it pot then, I know there's different words for it now, but we, we smoked, smoked pot all the time, so did my sister. <laughs> I had lice regularly. Every time they did a lice check in school, I had it. I don't know how they do it now, but I stood in a class where somebody came in, a nurse came in, and she poked her hair with, um, with these little sticks. And if you had it, everybody knew about it because you went in a different line and you were um, removed from class. What's important for me to tell all of you about this is I remember the looks back then, fourth and fifth grade. I don't know how else to say it, but it totally sucked for me on so many levels from home and at school. The teachers, when I had lice, rolled their eyes and had an attitude as, why is she here? Could I help coming to school with lice at nine years old? Absolutely not. I want all of you to remember that. My mom made me wear the same clothes at least three days a week. I got bullied for that. Uh, she chose to bathe us once a week. That was a deal. It was Saturdays. Um, and she made an exception for this school picture. I was really nervous. And um, let me wash my hair before um, my school picture. I was always picked last. And I avoided school as much as I avoided home, because it was trauma on both ends. May I tell you, the first really moment that I found, and by the way, it gets better from here. The worst is almost over. <laughs> but so, so, it sounds so sad. But no, it's got a great happy ending. But the principal, <laughs> the principal of this school, um, he, he used to see, I, would, I was bullied so badly that I avoided getting on the bus because all the girls said they were going to beat me up at the bus stop. And nobody ever took me on one-on-one, -on -one, by the way. It was always five-on-one, -on -one, and I was skinny and little, and I knew I didn't have a chance. Um, so I was very scared. And the bus driver was one of the most amazing people in that time uh, period for me because I would skip getting off on my bus stop because I was so scared about getting beaten up, I would just wouldn't get off the bus. He was kind and let me stay on the bus and dropped me off at a place, I swear to God, I was telling Brett the name of this, it's really, it really was a place called Woody's Wieners. It was, it was a, I swear to God, they made mini hot dogs. It was called Woody's Wieners, and somebody one time sprayed the van, took the S off, so it was Woody, Woody's Wiener was on the, the traveling thing. But he would, they made mini hot dogs. The owner there was great, too. Sometimes he'd give me a free hot dog. Um, I lied to the bus driver and said my mom was picking me up there when he knew that wasn't true, but he asked me where I lived and how far, and I remember telling him, it was just literally, it was about, realistically about a quarter mile, but you could see just past a trailer park where I lived, and uh, he would drop me off there, and I thought that was really kind of him because I was really afraid to get off the bus. The principal 
knew there was often times I wouldn't even get on the bus and I'd wander around school and act like I missed the bus because I was scared. He knew I got picked on and bullied and I avoided gym when I could um, because my mom also made us, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I changed my underwear once a uh, week. That's my mother's rule, not me. And so the kids would know that and make fun of me there too. So I avoided gym, it sucked. And uh, so that one day um, I wouldn't get on the bus and I was wandering around the hall and the principal lost, he just got so frustrated with me. He never really showed me much compassion, but he had just been tired of dealing with me. So he sees me in the hallway area and he's like, why aren't you on the bus? And I told him I was scared and he pointed his finger and I'll just never forget it. He yelled, he goes, you get on that bus. You gotta start standing up for yourself. And I was so scared, I ran on the bus, got off at Woody's Wieners later, and it just sucked. And so, but I tried to listen to what he said because I wanted him to like me. Um, I knew he thought I was pathetic, I felt it, but I wanted him to like me. So he said, stand up for yourself. So I'm gonna tell you um, a story about what happened about a week later. I was um, looking out my window and Don, my stepfather, was coming back from a drunk. Um, he was a different kind of drinker. He would be sober for a month and then steal my mother's welfare money and spend it all on alcohol. And he'd be gone about three weeks to a month drunk, and then when the money was gone, he'd come back. So he was walking back um, from a drunk, and all of a sudden I see all the kids in the trailer park neighborhood um, circle around him. I'm looking out the window, and there's Don, who's the only father I know, and he's standing there, and they all circle him, and next thing you know it, he drops his pants. And his boxers are on, but his pants are at his ankles, and then the kids go through his pockets, and they run off with, his, with whatever money they had that he had left on him. And I was embarrassed, but I thought that was going to be the, the worst of it. Um, and the next day at school, I'm standing in the lunch line, and I'm putting the milk and the apple on my tray, and there's a kid, a so handsome boy with platinum blonde hair that I had a huge crush on, by the way, never gave me the time of day, but boy, I like that boy. And... He turned around and looked at me for the first time that I, can, I ever remembered, made eye contact with me and started walking towards me. And it was a weird look, but I was nervous and happy for a second until he said this. Lunch is on your father today. That was the most painful thing that I could remember being ever a kid ever saying to me. Um, Lunch is on your father today. So this weird feeling came over me and instead of looking to a teacher for help, I listened to what that teacher said, and I took the, the apple and the milk off my tray. I went up to him, and I took it like a bat, and I smashed him in the face um, with the lunch tray. Now, that was very bad. <laughs> I know that was bad. The reason why I'm telling you this story is because I got sent down to the principal's office, and the principal, again, being so frustrated with me, says, why did you do this? You are going to be suspended. He was yelled at me. And when I just looked down the ground, and I said, he said, lunch is on your father today. He was still yelling, what does that even mean? I told him the story that I told all of you just now, and he cried. He put his head in his hands, and I think that was a really eye-opening moment for him that he realized I was listening, trying to do what he said, that my life was a real struggle, and he didn't make it any easier. From that day on, while I was there, the teachers all of a sudden were kinder to me. I know it changed him. I know that moment changed him. I felt it. He was nicer to me. He never raised his voice at me. Uh, I was, felt very much more taken care of at that school. It may have taken a situation like that for him to see it, but I believe that that circumstance changed how he deals with our struggling youth. It was short-lived, though, because by the time I was 10, I was removed into foster care. I had um, a number of different homes, and remember, I'm in school during this time. So... I'm coming to school with not only the trauma of poverty, and I know when Brett speaks of poverty, that is huge in your school district. With poverty, oftentimes comes trauma, like the trauma that was in my background that y'all wouldn't know unless I told you. You wouldn't, my face wouldn't read it. Uh, trauma now switching into foster cares. You wouldn't know it unless you um, really inquired about my background because I didn't talk about it. Uh, the first foster home learned about the past abuse I suffered when I was younger and thought that was too much for them, that uh, they couldn't handle that, um, that type of child. The second foster home, by then, I'm feeling major abandonment issues, um, not feeling safe anywhere. And that's the interesting thing. If you're lucky enough to grow up feeling safe, we all have our own stories, that's amazing. Remember, many of the kids that you meet, they don't feel safe at home. Some of them, they feel safer at school than they do at home, and we don't want to make it more traumatizing for them when they're here. So the second foster home by then I was stealing and definitely um, getting attention from older boys, which I um, 
I looked for, and they were concerned I'd be a bad influence on their kids, so they gave me up. And by the time I was in the third foster home at 14, I couldn't wait to be on my own. My sister was already on her own at a, as an emancipated minor, and I moved um, in with her. But that was the toughest time for me. It was in high school, and I'm going to talk about some amazing um, high school um, educators that really helped change my life in a major way. I was definitely suicidal then. I thought about it regularly. I think kids think about that more than we actually realize. Um, life is hard enough as a teenager with hormones and everything changing. You add trauma and poverty to it, and I guarantee you those kids oftentimes think this world would be a better place if I wasn't in it, and it's a terrible feeling to have. Um, and I think that um, we have the power to, to help change that. So, in the... Educators, when I got to middle school, things had changed. Um, I ended up going to Averill Park, and there was a guidance counselor named Kim Mahar. She was told about my background, knew I was in foster care, and said, you know something, this is amazing. She said to me, I'd like to see you once a week if that's okay. Um, she took time to know my, I say my file because I have criminal files now, but my, she knew about me. And she wanted, she wanted to hear my story, and nobody ever wanted to hear about me. No, to me, nobody ever gave a crap before. But she really, she showed me kindness and compassion. She made me feel good about myself. Um, she helped me to believe in myself. And I, when you think about, I think we all know why that's important. Just in case, I want to remind everybody that we often live up to the experiences or the expectations that those we care about place upon us. Does anybody in this room think my mother cared about what my future was? Absolutely not. Never helped with homework. She didn't care. In my, my, the bar was so low, so low for me that I knew, even at 14, my lot in life was to have kids with different fathers and be on welfare. That was my lot in life. Until I, I got into middle school and met my guidance, first guidance counselor, they really made me feel like I could change that pattern and I could be anything I wanted to be. So that's my story. Um, I, ended up, I ended up moving out on my own, going to undergrad, uh, ended up going to law school, oh, best thing I ever did, and um, I became a prosecutor helping, um, I think you guys get it, I was a special victims prosecutor for a reason. I could relate to those kids, I could relate to being in foster care, and oh my God, it was the most amazing feeling being able to be on their level. Um, they opened up so much and I was able to prosecute a lot of uh, bad people um, for harming children. Uh, and then this judgeship um, opportunity came, came open, and I was so afraid that I was going to miss being able to work with kids and that I was going to lose that connection. And then I met Joshua my first day on the bench. Uh, Joshua was uh, 16 at the time, just turning 17. Uh, he comes before me. I reviewed his file um, before uh, that morning's court, and I found out he was homeless, breaking into unlocked cars, um, stealing, living on the streets. Um, his mother... Um, I should say this, his father left him when he was about three. He was an alcoholic and his mother was a drug addict. She met a drug counselor in Florida and up and left him at 16 years old on the streets with no place to go. Um, he came before me and the first thing I thought of is our lives are so similar. Our stories are so similar. How is it that I'm sitting here looking at him and he's looking up at me? I felt an obligation to do something help him by opening up a door for him and making him feel like he had the power, knowing he had the power to walk through that door. After Joshua, I found out there ended up being 15 other kids who had the same, in my court at the time, who had the, the same uh, things in common, should I say. Fathers absent or in prison and mothers addicted to drugs or alcohol. I gotta tell you, they could be switched, right? Um, or, or emotionally unavailable. But there's one, one of those parents are not physically present, and the other one, if they are, is not emotionally present. They all um, suffer from poverty. Their crimes are escalating in seriousness. We find girls, even for me, sharing my story today was hard, but it's, I think for men it can be even harder. Their, their person, it just seems like they push things down. They don't want to get it out, where um, girls, it seems to be sometimes easier to, to get them to talk about it. So I've got more men, uh, young men than young women in my program because they're really angry um, and holding it in, and their crimes are escalating very quickly. They'll go from a disorderly conduct, uh, maybe vulgar language in the street, to all of a sudden breaking into unlocked cars, then smashing uh, cars um, 
and they're breaking into houses. If they're in school, they're struggling, they've dropped out or on the brink of flunking out or being expelled. All of them, uh, there wasn't one in my program um, that was succeeding well at school if they were in it. Most had, most of were exactly like this. When they come to court, they're either alone, not making eye contact, eyes down at the ground, outer shell honestly just looks pissed off at the world, um, and they act like they don't care. But if you look closer, you can see they're just really scared, scared kids. If they have somebody with them, you already know what half the problem is in their lives. Um, they're just enabling um, parents uh, who come in with them who um, reminded me very much, to be honest with you, of my own mother. Uh, they ha these kids feel worthless. They have no direction. They come across angry at the world. This is, all of them just literally had this. And I thought, what are we going to do with all of these um, young adults that are coming through here? And I thought, they need someone to look up to, right? They need some positive role model in their lives. We can't just ask these or tell these kids, well, you have to pick up yourself. You just have to face it and, and do it, do it right. They don't know what doing it right is. These kids don't even know how to, many of them don't even know what it means to set an alarm clock. I sure as heck didn't. My mom never did. She sapped off the system her whole life. Um, she woke up when she felt like waking up. So to, and then all of a sudden, if you get a kid like this and you want to put them on probation, just give them all the structure, that's what they need. Well, they don't have support through the structure. They don't understand the, the importance of being on time, valuing somebody else's time, valuing an education, what it means to work for hard for a dollar. They have no one in their lives showing them this. So to expect them to just do it, <laughs> kick them in the butt and do it, they need someone to get as an example for them and to talk to about it. So I created this, it's called a you can, the UCAM program, United Against Crime Community Action Network. And the benefit of this is even for the people, which makes me sad to think some people don't believe in kids, but even if someone wasn't a proponent of this pro program in our city, um, which I didn't find, I found a lot of support, but even if they're not, they are a proponent of reduction in crime. And when we help steer these kids in the right direction, we're reducing crime in our community. Um, and a really important thing, a lot of these kids are 19 to 26 years old that are in the program. If they get convicted of a crime, it's stuck on their record forever. They don't get youthful offender status, and there's no way out for them. I didn't want to saddle them at this young age with a criminal history if I didn't have to either, so I wanted to give them a chance. Initially, they plead guilty to a misdemeanor. They go on one year of interim probation. We all, they all have the same probation officer that has a passion for this as I do. They all have the same public defender. We have the same prosecutor. Um, there's an education component. No one graduates without getting at least their GED, or, or if they're in high school, they graduate high school. There's always an, an employment component. We work them to get a part-time job while they're in school or in their GED um, and let them know that they can do it, and we support them do it, and doing it, and we believe in them and know that they can handle it. They're drug tested regularly. We don't take anyone with heroin addictions or anything like that. There's programs for them, but this isn't it. But we, all of the defendants that are in my program, I still say smoke and pot. I can't help it for some, but that's, they smoke pot and they, a lot of them drink alcohol because it's their coping mechanism. I was doing it at nine, so most of these kids were doing it um, since the third or fourth grade as well. Uh, they meet with a mentor one hour a week. It's flexible, but we want to make sure it's four times a month. Um, this supports them. It gives them support through the structure, so when they complain or um, about something that mentor is able to give them a reason why um, they need to do that and the value of that and, they, um, and they're able to look up to that role model. If they successfully complete the year, sometimes they spend weekends in jail when they don't do it. So I've got a kid who's uh, Sebastian, we're going to talk about in a minute, spent two weeks in there for violations. Um, but if they successfully complete the program, they're allowed to withdraw that plea of guilty and get an adjournment and contemplation of dismissal. It basically means it'll be dismissed six months after that date if they stay out of trouble. So, I makes clear we don't, you know, it's not like you steal a candy bar and you get in the program. I mean, we take some really tough cases. Um, they're usually felonies, and a lot of them are breaking into cars or houses. Um, and uh, the county court judge agrees to so let me um, have them in the program. Well, we talked about that. We don't take sex crimes or DV. There are exceptions. I have a kid in the program who smashed his mother's window trying to get in the house. Um, Everybody has to agree that, uh, that this person gets in, but if somebody's got their hands around a, um, another person's neck, if it's a, that type of um, uh, physical domestic violence against their partner, uh, we don't typically take them. There's other programs, but you can, doesn't typically, um, we don't typically take them. Okay, 
So this is where I got to look on here, so bear with me. I've got to probably walk away from this a little bit. But this is a letter Pete um, gave his probation officer. Pete is one of the young men in my program. Young men that you guys maybe would be very frustrated with in the school system, but I want you all to see that there's such great hope for this kid. Very frustrating. Uh, his father left him when he was seven, um, just left him and didn't come back. Um, he had a really tough time dealing with that. He's not as resilient as some kids. I like to think I was pretty resilient, and so was my sister. But just because they're not as resilient doesn't mean that they're not going to make it with some help. And um, he definitely lacks that resilience and had a lot of anger issues, has a lot of anger issues with his father leaving and um, his mother uh, moving on to somebody else and working two jobs. She's just not there for him as much as he needs her to be. Um, so he started acting out in school. He would just walk off in school. He would tell teachers to, I think, F off and things like that. I mean, he was like really nasty to the teachers, um, but it was out of anger coming out. And um, he'd smash lockers, damage school property. Um, that's what he got arrested for, actually, was causing damage to one of the lockers, a criminal mischief. Um, we work with the school district. Um, they sign waivers um, allowing and releases, allowing us access to their records. The school knows what's going on um, in our court. The school knows about the bat their life background, and they're supportive of it. And he, gets, um, he meets with a counselor when he's at school. I was talking to Brett about this whole, um, when the kids act up in school or walk out and Cahoes were trying to change it, where then there's this reduced program where you only have to go two days in the afternoon. I'm not a supporter of that. I don't think that's teaching them consequences for their behavior. So I make Pete go to school all day, and it's actually been working. But during the time, one of the times that he was um, acting out, um, he was rude to his probation officer, and I made him write a letter. I put him in for the weekend. Um, he didn't just do that, he did a few things. Um, tested positive for marijuana, was very rude um, to the probation officer and skipped school. So he spent Fourth of July weekend in custody. And he wrote this letter, and I don't know if you guys can see, um, gets a chuckle out of people, right? Let me know what your favorite part was. Man, this kid's angry, but he's a kid, right? He just wants attention. That right there, if anybody sees that, you can't not have hope for all of these kids. But that, to me, is screaming evidence of he's just a boy who needs and wants attention and needs to learn consequences for his behavior in a non-shaming way. And I say non-shaming. I want to go back to that lice situation. I didn't understand it then, but I sure understand it now. I felt shamed for having lice when I was nine, and it wasn't my fault. It was 100% uncontrollable for me. I ask that you all be cognizant about that with these kids. There's a difference when someone fe does something wrong. Guilt is a good thing, and to talk about that, they should, he should feel guilty for smashing that locker or being disrespectful to a teacher, and we're teaching them to talk to them, to apologize, and understand how that teacher feels. But shaming them is telling them that they are bad. Not the act is bad, but they are bad. And I guarantee everyone in this room that these kids have been telling themselves that their whole lives, and that's what their parents have been telling them. They shame themselves enough, and I'm trying very hard to change that with them. Please be cognizant of that. Huge difference between guilt and shame, and the last thing you want to do is um, shame a child. Um, because they'll remember, I remembered um, when, my, when my teachers did that to me when I was younger. Um, so Sebastian, um, I'm going to look right up. Sebastian is a kid that nobody wanted in the program. Probation initially said no. Everybody lost hope for Sebastian, which broke my heart because I could still see when, him when he stood before me. His rap sheet picture, he's got this really angry look. But God bless this kid with such handsome looks and good health. Um, he's as blonde hair boy with these big blue eyes and he's angry at the whole world but he's scared and you look at his background and when he was three years old his mom up and left him I don't know what it is with Florida and Cohoes but she left him to Florida too and every once in a while she'd come back to try to be a mom um, but it was short-lived for a week or two and she'd leave um, dad I'm trying to be political, cor politically correct with this but I know I'm not gonna make it when I say that um, we would call him white trash he um, was a, he just is the same sapping off the system, puts his son down. This kid has nobody looking, believing in him, making him feel like he can be anything he wants to be. He has zero expectations on him, so what does he do? Zero. No job, drops out of school in 10th grade, um, starts breaking into cars because he needs money because he smokes pot to deal with the pain. 
and everybody gave up on him, and his crimes were escalating to the point where he was started smashing windows of cars um, to, get, um, to get inside them. And he's the toughest one in the program, but he's making really great strides. And I, I wish that you could see some of this on him. Can you guys read that? I'm going to try. My mother decided that she wasn't going to be around in my life when I was two. She would always pop up in my life, trying to be a mom for a few months, and I would always run back because I thought that maybe she missed me or realized that she made a mistake by leaving me. But it was like any other time. She would pop up and then leave. I thought, just like Shaka, Shaka is an author, and we'll say on that book in a minute. Just like Shaka, if I was smarter or better in sports or had better grades, it was one or the other would get, and I was just let down every time. That's the kids that come to school. They think if I was smarter, better, nicer, there must be something wrong with me. Kindness and compassion alone, if you can give that to kids and give a little bit of time, even when they're under your skin and crawling, right, acting out. Um, it can, it can just move mountains. It's moved mountains with him. He's got a full-time job now. He's taken his girlfriend out to dinner. Um, he's working on his GED. I'm hoping he's going to pass it in October. So he's, and he has not committed a crime since last August when he was in the program, and he committed seven in a year. So it's a big deal for him. Um, just a real quick, I thought some of you guys might want to know, we don't just throw these people with, um, with other um, with mentors, they have to get background checked, fingerprinted New York State mentoring pays for that, it's awesome. And um, they meet at a um, designated location that is semi-private, um, and they have to, it has to be approved. And you don't need a lot in common, what they need is just somebody who takes time and cares and listens to them. Um, it's pretty amazing. So. I'm going to tell you the one story with Leroy, because I think I'm probably um, going over my time a little bit here, but Leroy's an amazing story. Um, Leroy came at 19 years old. Again, if he was convicted of a, of a crime, he would, not, he would have it on his record his whole life. He comes in, he's six foot two, African-American male, about 240 pounds, most of it blubber. He's a heavy kid, he's type two diabetic already at 19 years old. He gets arrested two crimes. One, um, he tries to steal pink sneakers, um, girl sneakers, at Walmart. The other one is he steals about $240 of lotto tickets from Stewart's where he was working. So right now, that's all you know. You have a, a, a kid in front of me with his eyes down on the ground with two petty larcenies. The offer from the DA's office is plea to one petty larceny. It's a class A misdemeanor, go on three years probation. That means he has that for the rest of his life uh, on his record, and we know nothing about him. All I know is that the kid won't even look up at me. I have to say, Leroy, you need to look at me when I'm talking to you. We do what's called a pre-sentence investigation, and here's what I find out about Leroy. When Leroy was seven, his father died um, of heart disease. When he was eight and a half, his mother died of a heart attack. Um, they both were, um, had health issues um, with obesity when, since he was young, and he followed in their footsteps. He was shuffled between his uncles and aunts, and, and so was his sister. Sometimes they lived together and sometimes they had to live apart because the family couldn't take on two kids. Those pink sneakers he stole were for her um, because she needed them and she was getting picked on at school. Um, he got caught, so he thought if he stole a lotto ticket and made money, he could buy her the sneakers. But he's a really bad thief. Unlike me, by the way, who I was good. I never got caught, but when I was younger, I used to steal. I did. I was in foster care. I stole. Um, so... But, and I can't tell Leroy that, but I was dying to tell him that. You're just not as good as I, I was at it. So, <laughs> so he, I, I asked that he be in this program. And uh, when, when the New York State mentoring, uh, Brad, who um, interviewed him as well, he said to be in private, and I'm getting, there's a leader in that young man, you know? And I, I saw it from the day I met Leroy. I'd have to make him look at me, but I saw a leader in him. And um, I, he, get, he came into the program. And I hooked him up with a mentor named Rick, uh, and Rick's real name, or full name, is Ricardo Laguerre. Um, he is Haitian, six foot four, and about 240 pounds of muscle. He's a court officer in our family court system and an amazing human being. But Leroy didn't know that. Leroy heard that there was a, uh, a, young, a man named Rick who was going to be, who was a, a court officer. That's all I told him. So the first two times he was supposed to meet with his mentor, he skipped out on that meeting. And um, he just stiffed Rick. So Rick says to me, Andrew, I'll do whatever you want me to do, but this is the second time now. 
So I, I sign a bench warrant. Uh, Leroy comes before me, and I say, Leroy, you have one last time to meet with him. If not, you're out of this program. You're going to have a criminal conviction. It's a big deal. You can't do this again. He said he understood in the third time he met with Rick. And when he met with Rick, this is a great, great line. So Rick calls me later and says, so funny, Leroy looks across from him and says, bro, I'm really sorry. I thought you were going to be a little skinny white boy telling me how to live my life. It was great, right? It was great. So, we need, we, we get mentors that they look that they can say, I can be this person. Fast forward, I just want to say this, Leroy lost about 70 pounds in a year. He made, I, he just graduated, um, he's we're having a formal graduation of summer, but he just made it in August um, for the full year of the program. He would come in, he started looking me in the eye, the weights drop, and he's an amazing drum player. His mentor went to watch him go at the church to play drums. Uh, he just got accepted to two college, local colleges, and I feel so blessed to be part of a process that just helped the leader inside of him come out. And he's not going to let you know himself. He came with his eyes down. He would have taken that misdemeanor, three years probation, and walked away and had a lot less chance at life. He now is criminal history free. He stands up and proud and, uh, and is going to college. We actually just had um, a meeting. Where they're opening up five new UCAN courts in the state of New York based upon my pilot program. And they asked me to bring um, a mentee, and I brought him, and it was really amazing. He spoke of them, and he stole their hearts. He is an amazing young man, and he is clearly a leader and doing great. So, thanks. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And that's what I say, the power that y'all have. The, the, the feeling, my heart overspills with that because I was part of a process that helped bring out the leader in that kid. And that's what I hope all of you see, that those Leroy's, um, kids like myself growing up, they're all in your classes. Each and every one of them are a little you and a little me in there. And Joshua, so he was the first one in the program. He just graduated. And this is a quote on the record that he put um, his last day. He's going to formally graduate, but his last day in court with me those are his words when he said, it literally changed my life. When I first went to jail, I was lost and had nowhere to go. No good support system and what you did for me just literally changed my life and opened up lots of doors for me. Um, he's working full time now. Um, he got his GED and uh, he's doing a heck of a lot better than being homeless on the street. And he, um, he finished alcohol treatment um, and he goes to AA meetings now. He's an amazing kid. So. To wrap up, I just I hope I was able to, to convey this because I know some people, God knows, I've had teachers in, in my, and people um, in my court system, by the way, which I, had, I had gave um, similar kind of pep talks to. They have this pull yourself up by your bootstraps attitude, which I don't completely disagree with, by the way. I, want you, I hope you see the value of this program and the power that you guys have. We're not doing them any favors if we're opening the door and just carrying them through it all the time, right? But they can't pull themselves up by their bootstraps if they don't even know they have the power to do it or there are even bootstraps there to pull up. That's what I want you to remember, that these kids, they live up to the expectations that are set by them. And if they have to be believed in. If you don't believe in the kids, it's not going to work. But if you believe in them, holy crap, you have the power to really help change their entire life. And not just their lives, then they become role models to their children, to their siblings. And to be part of that process is one of the most amazing feelings I've ever had in my life. And, and you all do the same work, and I can't thank you enough um, for the work that you do every day. And that's it. <laughs> so.